Good morning, Rob. Great to be here. And New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap, Mr. Gilstrap. Good morning. In a better mood now. I am. Much, he, he I am. He got his sugar. The, choc- the chocolate has set in, and, and I'm ready to go. <laughs> courtesy, uh, we are fed by uh, Brookies, courtesy yeah. of Magistrate Jennifer Lemon. So, and I mean, these are they're tasty. There's they're like a good. dozen of them in there. And did you like those? Uh, what did you think? Yeah, I, I haven't had. Oh, yeah, they were great. Yeah. yeah, I haven't had it yet. I'll wait till the show's over. The special gift is the Reese's cup in the middle. How can you go wrong with that? You can't beat a Reese's yeah. cup. That's it, it's probably the best commercial ever with the peanut butter meets the yeah, chocolate. Yeah. And they, you know, I don't know if you remember those commercials mm-hmm. from like 40, 50 years ago where they just <laughs> accidentally <laughs> fell into each other and oh, it's a great idea, you know that kind of thing. It is a great idea. Yeah, it is. You combine peanut butter and chocolate, that should sell all you the time. You cannot go wrong. That's got to be recession proof. Make a sour fella happy. It did today. Uh, <laughs> it's wearing off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just, just picking at it and picking at it and picking at it. I'm going to make it bleed again. Yeah. Uh, John, why don't you introduce our next guest for us? I will. Um, Gene Meyer is on the, on the phone with us. Uh, he's written a book called Five for Freedom, the African-American Soldiers in John Brown's Army. By way of background, I've mentioned before that uh, twice a year I attend the Washington Authors Dinner. Uh, which is completely under the radar kind of event that happens in Georgetown every year. And during these, I, I put out the call um, that you know, anybody who's got a new book coming out, you should you should come on. And, and it has borne fruit. We've had David Stewart, Austin Camacho, Dan Maldea, and others. Um, uh, Jim, um, Brady. the guy, Brady, thank you, thank you. Uh, Grady, Grady. Brady. And um, Deaver, yeah. Jeff Deaver. And um, so... Uh, Gene reached out to me and said he's he's got a book that is relevant certainly to um, Black History Month, which is where we are in the, uh, in the month of December yeah. or February. February. Goodness gracious! And so, Gene, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Gene. You're a Maryland resident, correct? I am a Maryland resident. Yeah. What? what? Mont- Montgomery County, uh, you know, in Silver Spring, just outside D.C., but. I spent many years with the Washington Post traveling around the state from the eastern shore of Chesapeake Bay all the way out to Garrett County. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I used to live in Montgomery County myself from 88 to 92 in Montgomery Village. Okay, well, yeah, yeah it's it's quite a diverse state. And uh, my most recent book is called Hidden Maryland in Search of America Miniature, but that's why, not why I'm here this morning. Nope. Uh, let's talk about John Brown's raid. This is uh, something that almost everybody in the eastern panhandle knows something about on my drive home frequently throughout the course of the week i go right through harper's ferry so uh let's uh let's talk about this raid and and tell me about your book regarding it and the angle that you took to tell the story sure um and so the raid was october 16th when it started 1859 and 18 men led by john brown uh marched down a uh, quiet uh, country road on a dark sunday evening to harper's ferry where they seized the federal arsenal and uh, seize the town, actually, and their plan was to incite a slave insurrection. Uh, it failed in its immediate goal. Uh, 36 hours later, uh, the Marines, led by uh, uh, Robert E. Lee and uh, Jeb Stewart, uh, stormed what became known as John Brown's Fort. It was actually the Arsenal Fire Engine House where he had retreated, and it ended. Um, but with him were five African Americans, and in all the accounts of John Brown over the years, the, the legendary accounts of John Brown, uh, these five men were treated as footnotes, if at all, pretty much dismissed. And uh, in uh, Veterans Day 2000, I covered a, a ceremony at a, a black cemetery outside of FedEx Field, dedicating a, a memorial plaque to one of the five. His name was Osborne Perry Anderson. He was the sole survivor and wrote the only insider account of the raid. And, uh, you know, flash forward uh, a little bit and End of two, uh, 2004, I left the Post. I wrote a magazine article for the Post about Osborne Perry Anderson, sole survivor. Of course, my research, I you know, learned that there were, he wasn't the only one, that there were four other people. And uh, he seemed to have a close relationship with Marianne Shedd Carey. Uh, he had uh, immigrated to Canada North, Canada West, rather, east of Detroit, and uh, from Pennsylvania, from southeastern Pennsylvania. And Marianne Shedd Carey was also from there, and she'd started a newspaper called Provincial Freeman. And uh, I thought there was a close relationship between the two. She later uh, moved to District Columbia, where she was a suffragist and a school principal and, 
And uh, I thought maybe he did too, and I thought maybe it was a close relationship. Some of her papers at Howard University, I went there a few years later, I found nothing about him in her papers, but I did find letters that she had reprinted in the um, Provincial Freeman uh, from uh, uh, from another one of the five writers, um, John Anthony Copeland, to his family back in Oblin. And they were very uh, moving, very pointed letters. And I thought, well, there's a story here, but it's really about all five. And that was born the, uh, uh, the Five for Freedom, the idea of the book. And uh, so, you know, a few years later, uh, I uh, got back into it and we got a book contract and I jumped in and I managed to contact a, a lot of descendants. Uh, there's just an amazing amount of resources online. The Library of Virginia has the uh, the papers of Governor Wise from that period. He was one who signed the death warrant for John Brown and the others who were, who were caught. And... Uh, uh, then it was off to the races. In 2009, there was a 150th uh, anniversary of the John Brown raid. I didn't attend, but it was pretty well attended by a number of the Senates, and somebody in the Park Service gave me a list, so I was able to contact the Senates and um, interview them and really trace the story of these five men um, down through the generations, starting with, you know, where and when they were born, how they were raised. Uh, four of the five were free men of color. There was one man from South Carolina who was believed to be a fugitive slave. And interestingly, at the trial, there was a trial in Charlestown, and he was acquitted of one trial, one charge of treason, because um, under Dred Scott, uh, if you were a slave, you could be you could be a citizen, therefore you couldn't commit treason. But there were enough other charges so that uh, he was executed along with uh, John Anthony Copeland on December 16, 1859. John Brown had been executed uh, two weeks prior to that. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another, and uh, with this list of descendants, uh, there was uh, one of the raiders was named Danfield Newby, and he had joined Brown to free his enslaved wife and their children who were in Prince William County, Virginia. And um, so he was, uh, he was killed at Harpers Ferry, and uh, he was actually trying to rejoin Brown at the, the John Brown's fort, and he was shot by a sniper, and then... Uh, the people of Harpers Ferry were very angry, and they descended on him, and they, uh, you know, um, dismembered him and left him for the hogs, literally. And um, so he never got to, you know, free his his family. Mm-hmm. And um, are you, uh, so, Gene, but, Gene? To me, just real quick, are you familiar sure. with the ghost of uh, Dangerfield Newby? I don't know about the ghost of Dangerfield Newby, but I will tell you that um, as a result of this book coming out. Uh, Harriet, well, Harriet was, and her children were sold into slavery in Louisiana, and she remarried. She was in a contraband camp, remarried a, a, a of the U.S. colored troops, and he was actually from Berkeley County. And they moved back up uh, north and made a life for themselves near Mount Vernon. And, um, and there are lots of descendants, both in Warrington and, and other places. And um, uh, a, a school teacher in Fairfax, fourth grade school teacher, used this, my book, with her class, and they nominated Dangerfield Harriet Newby for a state highway memorial plaque, which was actually erected in northwestern Culpeper County in uh, May of 2022. Now, Dangerfield Newby had these descendants. One of them, I learned, was named Ashton Robinson III. He lived out in a tiny town in Utah, and his parents were from D.C. They are both African-American, but they were very fresh, and, and they passed for white, and they moved to Tony Western, Connecticut, where he grew up thinking he was, he was not African-American. He learned in his mid-40s that he was. And, um, uh, and there were all these layers of lies. His mother had said she'd gone to, uh, well, you know, the white teacher's college. She'd gone to black teacher's college. They both graduated from Dunbar. So we started doing all this research, which he was very generous in sharing. And it started before the Internet. So he was going from courthouse to courthouse. And uh, the Mormons were helping him. He was living in Nevada at the time. And uh, he was very generous uh, sharing all this information with me. So that's a, a big part of the book. In fact, that's the epilogue, uh, because one of the lessons from the book is that uh, black history is American history. And uh, we all own it. And uh, until we all deal with it, you know, we'll never, uh, never achieve our aspirations of out of many, we're one, you know, as Americans. Um, so I don't know about his ghost, but I do know that, uh, that uh, Dangerfield and Harriet Newby live on in this and this uh, it was plaque in, in mm-hmm. northwestern Culpeper County. Yeah, apparently one of the most reported ghost sightings in Harper's Ferry is that of Dangerfield Newby. 
Uh, go ahead, John. The five African Americans that were part of John Brown's army, were they a part of the original army that Brown assembled or were they picked up along the way in the march to Harper's Ferry? No, they were part of the original army that Brown assembled. He was trying to uh, recruit a lot more and um, uh, and he, the, the, the raid was actually supposed to occur earlier and there were rumors throughout the countryside uh, that uh, that this was going to happen and there were supposedly other enslaved people or enslaved people were going to join him but they, you know they didn't get the memo that that the the, the raid had been um, they had been changed uh, no these were all uh, original uh, recruits as you, as you will and two of them from Oberlin I mentioned Jonathan Copeland and um, uh, and um, uh, Shields Green was from the Charleston area. He was believed to be an escaped slave. And he also befriended Frederick Douglass. He lived with him in Rochester for a while. And uh, he famously, uh, he, he and um, Frederick Douglass met with Brown before the raid a couple of months earlier in uh, Chambersburg at Vanna Quarry. And uh, Brown wanted to recruit uh, Frederick Douglass and other prominent uh, African Americans. And Douglass said, you were walking into a steel trap in which you'll never emerge alive. And they were getting ready to leave, and he turned to Shields Green and said, what do you want to do, Shields? And Shields says, I think I'll go with the old man. And he did. He went with uh, Brown to Arpus Ferry, and he was executed, and he had opportunities to escape. In fact, with uh, Osmond Perry Anderson, he chose not to. And uh, uh, Douglas, in uh, 1881, there was a black college established on the hill overlooking Arpus Ferry, Historic College. Douglas gave the commencement speech, and he had a lot of praise for Brown. He said, if there's ever a monument erected to Brown, there should be a place on it for, for Shields Green. Um, so that's, you know, that's part of the story. But they were all, they were all recruited. They weren't, they didn't join along the way. And they assembled at this, at this so-called Kennedy Farm, five miles from Harvest Ferry in Washington County, Maryland. So. Yeah. Uh, Jane, of uh, the five, uh, uh, two of them were uh, killed during the engagement. Two of them were killed, uh, were executed, and then Anderson escaped. How did he escape? What was the, and did he escape at the battle or after he'd been captured or what? Well, he was, uh, he was guarding the arsenal gate with uh, a white, uh, one of the white raiders, uh, Albert Hazlitt. And there are some uh, differences uh, about his account because he said they left when they saw they could be of no more use to the old man because the Marines arrived, and there was some question about whether it was Tuesday afternoon or, you know, or, or Monday, but they managed to they go along the Potomac River and then cross over, and then they went to the Catoctin Mountains and and uh, headed north, and then at, at some point uh, Hazlitt got sore feet, and uh, and they split up, and uh, Osborne Anderson proceeded to uh, into Pennsylvania, and eventually uh, found his way back to uh, Canada. And looking like a skeleton, according to one of the accounts, and Hazlitt uh, went to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where he was from, and he was he was captured and he was brought back and he was tried, convicted, and executed in March of 1860. Uh, so, uh, so Anderson was never captured. He uh, he escaped before uh, the troop or shortly after the troops arrived. Is that correct? Yes, uh, and uh, when he did, he, when he went to Pennsylvania and uh, and he took a train to. Philadelphia area where his family was and he went to see his father and uh, his father didn't want to see him and basically told him to go away and he was not held in high regard among the free African Americans in southeastern Pennsylvania um, in fact even Dangerfield Newby had descendants in Prince William County and there was a certain stigma attached to the descendants even well into the you know 20th century um, so uh, he was not considered a hero at that point, and he kind of faded into obscurity. And then he published this little book, 75 pages, A Voice from Harpers Ferry with help from Mary Ann Chet Gary. And he basically died impoverished. He died. He went to uh, D.C., was a messenger, and uh, he died in 1872 of, uh, of uh, what they call it, consumption, tuberculosis. And he visited Harpers Ferry uh, shortly before he died, and made sort of a nostalgic visit. So, he was, you know, the, and the papers at the time, uh, called him the hero of Harper's Ferry, but um, you know he wasn't always considered to be a hero, why even would, by his own people. Why were they not? Why did, would they not consider them a hero? Well, because it was you know they were uh, 
I won't use the word terrorists, but they were uh, they were insurrectionists, and, uh, and and there was you know even uh, there were respect for the, for the law, whether they agree with it or not. And it was he was they were it was a controversial action. I mean, the country was already polarized, and it, it further polarized the country, and really often considered the spark that led to the Civil War. And slavery was at the root of it. I mean, of, of all the secession um, resolutions passed by the Southern states. I think only one Texas didn't mention slavery. All the rest said slavery was the reason for it. And um, um, so he was, you know, but there, and there was a lot of uh, uh, contest over who, who would get the remains of those who were actually executed. Uh, and it turned into a bitter dispute. And, um, you know, John Anthony Copeland was from Oberlin, and his father wanted to get the remains back there. And uh, Governor Wise said, no, a black man can't come. You can send a white man. They sent a uh, professor from Oberlin, and, and meanwhile, the students had uh, taken possession of other remains, and they would let them go. Uh, so it was, you know, it was highly controversial. It was very, in fact, you look at the letters that Governor Wise received. I mean, it's all all online. At the, or actually, I got microfilm delivered up, to, up here. Um, and uh, it's interesting that the letters that were pouring in uh, were all about John Brown, to, to, that he should be pardoned or somehow his you know sentence should be reduced virtually nothing about the black raiders which to me was interesting because the abolitionists supposedly were all about freeing black people but when it came to these five people uh, the poor Mexican, there was very little interest in them um it was all about john brown uh so. during the during the trial of the two that were executed uh was it a military tribunal or it was the civil trial who what was the representation and the like it was a civil trial. It was in Charlestown in the courthouse. It's still there. Uh, they had 12, 12 jurors and the judge. And um, all the, the jurors and the judge were all slave owners. And um, But the judge uh, was particularly impressed with uh, John Anthony Copeland. He said if there was anybody that he could have, would have spared, it would have been, would have been he. And um, interestingly, there were all these, you know, the concern about would there be a slave insurrection and nothing happened before the trial and then after the convictions and execution. Um, strangely, uh, a lot of the farmers had their crops torched and their barns burned and the speculation, uh, you know, in hindsight, was, that was the insurrection. It just didn't come the way Brown had hoped it would because he wanted to run off into the, you know, the Appalachian Mountains and wage guerrilla war in the Shenandoah Valley. Of course, that never happened. But no, they were, it was a civil, it was, a criminal trial in a, in a in a civil courthouse, and you know it was all very legal, and and um, uh, you know you can read the transcript. It was um, it was it was, it was no court martial. In fact, if you go to the Charlestown courthouse today, you the John Brown trial room is is sort of set aside as a. Not as a museum, but set aside to to where the the trial happened. What was what was John Brown's end game in this? I mean, you, he raided the arsenal, he got the weapons, and what was his plan to step two? Well, his plan, at least what he told his recruits, and he waited until the last minute. Many of them didn't know. I thought they were just going to run off some slaves to Canada, which he'd done before. But he, he had a very grandiose uh, plan, which was to. Uh, you know, uh, inside a slave insurrection, they were going to go off into the into the Blue Ridge, and they were going to wage a guerrilla war against the the planters in the valley, and somehow it was going to topple the, the whole institution of slavery. Uh, that was his you know scheme, but he made a, a lot of uh, tactical errors when he was at the ferry, and uh, you had to wonder whether he was thinking things through, whether he, you know he, he thought by becoming a martyr he could achieve more than had he uh, achieved his earlier plan. I mean, there was a, a, a passenger train that came from the west, and they stopped at Harper's Ferry, and um, and he let them go through as a sign of his, quote, goodwill. Of course, they went down to the Monocacy and and uh, contacted the feds, and then, and then you know, the federal forces came, plus there were a number of local mil- militias from uh, Jefferson County and even from Richmond, and, you know, game over. Um, so that was one mistake. Plus, he was very indulgent toward the hostages, which included... Uh, George Washington's grandnephew, uh, Lewis Washington, and uh, he allowed them to uh, 
uh, under escort with his men to go out and visit with their with their relatives in the ferry. Um, and uh, and there were some of his, his you know some of his men said, you know, let's go. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? And Brown just kind of delayed and delayed until it was all over. So kind of you have to wonder what his what his end game was. Whether he really thought he could pull off this grand scheme, or whether he thought maybe. Uh, I mean, he's, one of his last words is he thought that that uh, could somehow be solved the slavery question without blood. But he comes to the conclusion that you know that it would, it would require a bloodbath essentially, which it did. I mean, the the, the war that followed um, resulted in, what seven hundred thousand fatalities. The numbers varied, but it used to be they used to say six hundred thousand. I think now the figure's higher, and um, you know, and the embers still smolder. 165 years later, which is how long did story. how long did it take Lee's troops to get to Harper's Ferry? How, how many days went by? Well, the, the, they seized the town Sunday night, um, October 16th, and um, I would say, well, Tuesday morning was when Lee's troops and they had come earlier. They came by train, um, and that's when they stormed the uh, John Brown's fort. So it wasn't that long. It was maybe. 24 hours, and Lee had been at home. I mean, he was uh, he was Army Corps of Engineers. He was not really. He wasn't wasn't a military man in the traditional sense. And um, um, you know, he was pulled away from uh, from uh, from the became the Custis Lee Mansion um, to uh, to take charge. So it wasn't uh, maybe 18 hours. Would, say, would this, <clears throat> Gene? Would this have been Lee's last active defense of the Union before the Civil War? Yeah, I think that's probably fair to say that. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting um, dichotomy, right? It is, and uh, you know, and he was, uh, you know, and and of course, Jeb Stuart was his second in command at Harpers Ferry, and uh, and they were tasked with ending this uh, this insurrection. We talk a lot today about insurrection. Well, this was an insurrection in 1859 that came to a came to a conclusion without uh, succeeding. Um, so, in, in one sense, you know, he postponed, I guess, the inevitable bloodbath, uh, and in another sense, it uh, accomplished its immediate goal of of ending ending uh, John Brown's raid. That's the- interesting. The book is Five for Freedom, the African-American Soldiers and John Brown's Army. The author, Gene Meyer. Gene, where can we find the book? So the book is available uh, through websites, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, some bookstores. uh, uh, It's uh, Curious Iguana in Frederick, which is not too far from you all, has it or can get it for you. Mm -hmm. And I was just going to add one more thing about Osborne Anderson, a little footnote. I gave a talk uh, over a year ago uh, to... um, Chester County, Pennsylvania Historical Society, and we always thought that he had no children. My, my original source was Dennis Howard. I thought he was a grand, grandson, but it turned out he was collateral. So he had this talk, and then somebody did done some research, discovered that he actually fathered a child in Pennsylvania in 1852, and and then uh, you know the the, the the trail sort of evaporates after a generation. But you never know what you're going to find out. I mean, there's so much, so much uh, yet to learn. So that's that's the fun of it and the challenge, and uh, uh, it was a great adventure. It took almost uh, 20 years to, from start to finish, and I'm still working on it. Gene, thank you so much for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Always great to learn more about history. Thank you. I appreciate it, too. Thanks, Gene. Thanks, Gene. Gene Meyer. Thank you. And uh, five for freedom.